Good afternoon and welcome to Understanding the Basics of Livestock Market Regulation. My name is Audrey Thompson and I'm a staff attorney here with the Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. Here at the Center, we provide numerous resources for agricultural and shale legal stakeholders through our website at aglaw.psu.edu. Here on our homepage, we have our upcoming events, our social media feeds, and our latest Agricultural Law Weekly Review, which provides an update of recent ag law developments, including a full listing of ag-related state and national legislation and executive branch publications. We also publish the Shale Law Weekly Review, which covers recent oil and gas and energy-related developments. All of our publications are available for subscription by email, so you can receive those right in your inbox every week if you sign up for them. We also host a research by topic feature on our website where we maintain our virtual resource rooms, which provide compiled resources on multiple singular topics in agricultural and shale law. We also have our issue trackers for agricultural and shale law, which are similar to our resource rooms, but they are focused uh, they are focused on a particular topic, but these provide more of a timeline of developments for each issue so you can see an issue developing through statutes, regulation, or case law. We also provide audio and video content with our agricultural and shale law podcasts, which are available on all of the major podcast platforms and our YouTube channel, which where a recording of this webinar will be posted for future viewing. Additionally, the center operates the Pennsylvania Agricultural Mediation Program, which is funded through the USDA. This program has historically facilitated mediations between ag producers and the USDA, but its authorization has been expanded over the last several years, and we are now able to mediate a broader range of issues between different parties. Jackie Schweikler is our program coordinator, so please feel free to reach out to Jackie with any questions about ag mediation. And finally, we have our events page, which lists all of our upcoming events and presentations and where you probably registered for this webinar. But if you hover over and click on past events, you can find the PowerPoints and other materials from our presentations posted on the event page after each event. All right, so today's webinar on uh, crop insurance is part of the center's agricultural uh, Understanding Agricultural Law Series, a course of webinars designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not necessarily specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, which was established through the 2019 Farm Bill. The Agricultural Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low-interest loans and grants. This is the seventh webinar in the Understanding Agricultural Law series. Previous topics include labor laws, energy development, regulation and land use and regulation of agriculture, statutory protections for ag operations, agricultural cooperatives, and livestock market regulations. If you missed any of these, all of these webinars are available on our YouTube site. We do have upcoming uh, webinars in this Understanding Agricultural Law series. Mark your calendars for Friday, November 18th for Understanding the Basics of Federal and State Conservation Programs. Friday, December 16th for Understanding the Basics of Licensing and Regulation of Direct Agricultural Product Sales. That will focus mainly, mainly on fruits and vegetable type sales. And Friday, January 27th for Understanding the Basics of Agricultural Finance. And finally, just a few reminders, this webinar is being recorded. Um, please use the Q&A feature for questions. All right, I will now turn this presentation over to Brooke Doerr. Oops. Over to Brooke Doerr. Brooke joined the Center for Agricultural and Shale Law as a staff attorney in 2019. Prior to coming to the center, Brooke served as chief counsel to Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and before joining PDA, Brooke practiced law in Lancaster County for 18 years. Brooke writes, speaks, and presents regularly on agricultural law issues. He serves as the main state correspondent for our Agricultural Law Podcast. He oversees the Agricultural Law Weekly Review and helps connect the center to the larger Pennsylvania agricultural community. Brooke, the screen is yours. Okay. So I wrote up this little synopsis of uh, what we were going to cover here today, uh, talking about farmers being price takers and um, 
you're dealing with perishable crops. Uh, here we are in North America where we experience all four seasons with a vengeance. Um, so uh, obviously we have uh, lots of uh, planning to do in the ag world for uh, the extremes of weather and uh, temperature and other natural disasters. And that's what we're gonna talk about here is crop insurance defined by, and if you ever worked in the insurance industry, I did for a while when I was a young lawyer there, you, you need an insurable event. In other words, you need basically a disaster or some type of casualty loss. So those are the types of programs we're gonna talk about today is the things that USDA does through the risk management agency that are keyed upon some type of an insurable event, a casualty loss, i.e. some type of natural disaster. Now, I, I just want to say that up front because I noticed in this little synopsis that I wrote that towards the end, I talked about innovative livestock and dairy margin coverages, and I'm not going to talk about those because those are not keyed on uh, insurable events. In other words, natural disasters. Those are more or less just price uh, supports or revenue support programs. And that's kind of a whole nother thing. So um, even though, and this is the irony of it, that the uh, Risk Management Agency, RMA at USDA, does administer, for example, the dairy margin uh, coverage program, the DMC um, program, under the rubric of uh, their insurance programs, but technically it's not an insurance program and it's not based on any type of insurable event occurring. So in any event, that's a little explanation of why that's listed in here, but we're not going to talk about it. Um, okay, we're going to talk about the history of federal crop insurance programs uh, and the program as it exists today. We're going to talk about the present things that USDA Risk Management Agency uh, offers and um, and of course, the federal government subsidizes and reinsures all the private insurers who offer those insurance products. And then we'll talk a little bit about some other disaster type programs that where, in fact, uh, payments are made for the loss of an ag commodity, uh, whether it be a crop or livestock. And, and that does include poultry uh, in this world anyway. Uh, now, and, and here's my little note at the bottom of the screen again, the same note that I just said to you before about we're not going to cover uh, the dairy margin uh, coverage program, the DMC program. Uh, and that's really a, a different thing. That's all about uh, ensuring yourself against declines in the market that are unrelated to some type of disaster. All right. Now, obviously, farming is steeped in risk. You have all these little uh, uh, or all these you know, factors that come into play. You've got a living product that you're growing, whether it's a plant or an animal. Uh, you're relying upon natural resources, whether it's the nutrients in the soil or whether it's the water falling from the sky and running on the ground. Uh, you're dealing with all the extremes of weather and temperature uh, and rain and hail. And now, of course, we're dealing with climate change on top of all of that. Um, so the uh, risks that farming was always steeped in has now become uh, one more risk, which is uh, what are we going to do about the uh, progression of attempting to grow crops in some perhaps different temperatures and different conditions than uh, we're historically used to. Now, obviously, insurance is the solution. And um, it's kind of funny, I was giving a presentation on um, uh, Monday of this week, uh, and uh, no, maybe it was Tuesday uh, of this week, and, and I was trying to stress to people how amazing insurance can be when it works. Uh, and it's, you know, it's somewhat of, a, a, of an, um, an amazing invention, one of mankind's great inventions. You can tell I'm an insurance nerd because who else would say something like that? But it is true. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> the pri private industry was never and isn't today uh, historically willing to take on the scope of risk that agriculture takes on in conducting its day-to-day -day business. Uh, private insurance industry uh, did not really fill the void, let's just say, uh, in the beginnings of the 20th century um, to provide crop insurance with at the level and the widespread nature that was needed to provide insurance against 
uh, weather and other natural disaster related uh, risks that uh, farmers faced. Um, there are, and still are, there were and still are, single peril policies, that's the word for it, like a hail policy. And you even see insurance companies that still have the name like rain and hail. Um, you know, and that was from the days of uh, providing these single risk policies that would just deal with one thing, hail, for example. And those policies actually still do exist, but the kind of policy that you need in today's world uh, and this is actually an insurance term that exists in all sectors, not just agriculture, is a multi-peril insurance policy. And that's abbreviated MPIC, as you see in the uh, uh, slide here. And that is a term of art in the insurance business. And you might know, see that abbreviation to, uh, from uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, crop insurance or any other insurance, uh, your homeowners, automobile, commercial uh, liability policies, um, there, you know, your homeowners is the uh, multi-peril policy because you're insuring your home against some of the same things, uh, weather uh, incidents, that sort of thing. Um, so the private industry, again, used, had sold and still does sell these single peril policies, but not a multi-peril policy. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason is that the scope of that type of risk for farming was just too large for the private insurance industry and sometimes too small because you'd have a small farmer who needed insurance and it wasn't worth their economic uh, 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 you know time of day so to speak to uh, you know to be involved in you know insuring a small farm uh, with so little money in it for them so private industry was you know just wasn't fitting. Uh, either the risk was too large or the risk was too small, or the risk was way too prone to loss. Insurance companies do not like to insure things that are this uh, risky, so to speak, uh, and to do it in a way that would make them money in accordance with their normal underwriting uh, procedures and processes as a private company with obligations to their shareholders, it was too expensive. So all of those things, coalesce to basically leave the farmers uh, in 20th century America, uh, particularly the early parts of the 20th century, without the insurance that they needed to safely conduct their business. Um, so <clears throat> at uh, uh, the end of the Dust Bowl and the end of the Depression, um, that was when the federal insurance, uh, or excuse me, the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, the FCIC, was created in 1938. And it, they started very, very small, uh, small experimental uh, crop policies uh, that would be single crop in limited areas. Uh, you know, they didn't know how this was going to go, particularly since they were going to end up meaning the uh, Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, which was a corporation created by the U.S. government um, and, and still needed to at least break even and not become a, uh, you know, a, a budget appropriation. Um, uh, all, I shouldn't say, I'm not sure if they even break even to this day, I shouldn't say that. Uh, but in any event, um, to continue to operate without bankrupting the U.S. government, let's just put it that way, they needed to know if this was going to work or not. They needed to know if this was even a viable thing to be doing, uh, because clearly the industry wanted it, needed it, um, and the, you know the depression and the dust bowl told them that. Uh, now the question was to find out whether it was something that could actually work in practice, uh, and it started very slow. Things really didn't even pick up all the way in through the sixties and seventies. Um, the Federal Crop Insurance Act. And there was multiple versions and, and permutations of the authority, uh, the enabling legislation that created the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. Just the 1980 uh, was sort of a, a watershed uh, set of amendments uh, to the Federal Crop Insurance Act that created the beginnings of the system that we know today. So the point of all this, crop insurance is not that old. It is not something that uh, has been with us for decades and decades and decades, like many other USDA programs. It was there, but it was very, very experimental and small. It wasn't until the 80s, until this idea of the multi-peril uh, coverage, you know, and a multi-peril policy ended up coming into being. 
Now, the initial concept, and this is basically uh, uh, to a degree with us, you know, even to this day, but at higher amounts, but it was uh, multi peril policy uh, was made available uh, with premiums 30% subsidized by the federal government. So it was underwritten in like a standard insurance policy in the sense that, you know, risks were analyzed um, and, you know, actuaries worked it all out and then they figured out what a premium would be. And then the federal government subsidized 30% of that premium because it was still too expensive uh, for farmers. And uh, at that time, it was uh, a maximum of 65% uh, coverage of a loss. Now there are many products that go much higher than 65% of coverage. So it, in other words, that was, um, uh, there were no policies that covered losses 100% in those days. Um, uh, so you could look at it like the beginnings of the of modern crop insurance, there was always a $45,000 deductible no, $35,000? Yeah, $35,000 deductible, essentially, or I shouldn't say a 35% deductible. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, is again, as I said, the, the FCIC was is sort of a model of a public-private partnership in the sense that it is an independent corporation, but it's wholly owned by the government. Um, the entire operation in terms of the day-to-day -day functioning uh, is managed by USDA's Risk Management Agency, RMA. Uh, and actually, I think I have a slide later that tells us what year RMA was actually uh, uh, created. It wasn't in the 1980 bill. Um, the all the policies, the wording of every policy is uh, approved by uh, USDA's uh, risk management agency. And of course, the premium rates, even the even with the government subsidies, you know, the whole entire uh, premium structure is approved by the government. And then the premiums are uh, partially subsidized. I think I have a slide later that tells you what they look like today in terms of the percentage that is being subsidized by the US government. I believe it's in the 60s. Um, and um, uh, so the private sector insurance companies essentially act as government contractors and they sell and service and they're reimbursed and reinsured for all of the administrative costs, uh, every other cost that they have, as well as the payouts that are made. So this is not the private insurance company's money that is being used to pay claims in the end. They front the payment of claims, and then the federal government reimburses them 100% or 100 cents on the dollar. Now, there is a little extra, in which I'll explain in a minute, in terms of well, what's, when it, what's in it for them. Um, the 1994 Act was another sort of watershed in the development of the statutory authority for the federal crop insurance programs. Uh, there had been a number of serious droughts in the late 80s and through the early 90s, and there had been a number of congressional ad hoc disaster assistance bills. And, you know, Prior to crop insurance being as prevalent as it is today, and all of the various offerings that are available today, essentially, there was this reliance or this hope and uh, trust and uh, a desire from the ag community that, well, when it gets bad, the legislature is going to pass some type of ad hoc disaster assistance bill. And of course, that's exactly what was going on in the late 80s there, uh, which led to um, uh, some, I'll put it this way, there's always been a little bit of a tug of war between the concept of legislatively enacted ad hoc disaster assistance bills, which are certainly always well received. And we all know that now because we live in a world where we have, have you know, money has just been showered uh, on the private sector uh, and the citizenry, uh, you know, at large, so to speak, by the federal government over the last several years due to the disaster of COVID. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's a familiar concept to us today, the ad hoc disaster assistance bill. That's, we are living through probably the largest set of ad hoc disaster assistance bills that this country has ever seen. I mean, without a doubt, this is the largest set of, of, of such ad hoc disaster assistance bills this country has ever been involved with um, and, uh, and all related to COVID. Uh, so the, um, 
there's been that tug of war between the reliance on those things and then the government's desire to essentially condition people to not rely on that, but to buy crop insurance instead. And so, you know, every time there's an ad hoc disaster assistance bill passed, some people say, well, not, you're doing the wrong thing here. You're, you're not incentivizing people or you're disincentivizing people from bri- buying the crop insurance that we have worked so hard to, to make available to farmers. So that tug of war continues, um, uh, and it's certainly greatly reduced now with the um, uh, the the advent of crop insurance at at the scope that it is now operating. Um, now the 1994 Act incentivized uh, that this was at a point where that was that tug of war over were these ad hoc disaster bills disincentivizing participation in crop insurance, it was clearly recognized to be a problem. So the 1994 Act made participation in the crop insurance, the federal crop insurance program as it existed at that point, mandatory to be eligible for anything else like various deficiency payments, price supports and things like that that existed at that time, uh, as well as uh, any type of um, USDA associated loan, whether it was a, a, a guaranteed loan or a direct loan uh, through FSA. So that was the sort of the, the legacy of the 94 Act was creating that mandatory uh, incentive or mandatory requirement that incentivized um, everyone to buy crop insurance and put it right out there and say, you're not going to get these other benefits unless you do buy this. Um, so now that was in fact later repealed, but I, it, it did its job. Now, one of the things that the 94 Act also did that was really important is because th- they were making participation in crop insurance programs mandatory for other USDA benefits, there was a recognition that, well, how about we have a free level that is does not require much in the way of premium payment that will get everybody in the system and understanding the concept of what this can do for you and why it is the best way to go. So they created this this catastrophic coverage level, which has you know minimum, and we'll get to it in a second. Minimum uh, premium requirement, in fact, no premium requirement for the basic level. Uh, that was essentially given out as okay. You must participate in the crop insurance program, but you're going to get in at at this base level, this catastrophic coverage level, uh, essentially almost for free. So um, that was sort of the, you know, the perhaps maybe that's the carrot and the mandatory requirement was the stick. I don't know. So um, and it's important to understand this, that there is this base level of catastrophic, catastrophic coverage, which comes very, very cheaply. And that still exists today. Um, now, the CAT coverage uh, was for losses, and, and these will be familiar numbers as we go through. This for losses exceeding 50% of an average yield. So in other words, that's like saying that the first 50% of the loss at the catastrophic coverage level is on you, is on you, Mr. Landowner, Mr. Farmer. And then uh, everything that you suffer after a 50% loss uh, of your average yield will be paid at 60% of a certain established price per crop per year that RMA would establish. Now, 100% of that premium is subsidized. As I said, it's basically premium list. It's a zero premium uh, coverage for the cat- catastrophic coverage. And you just paid, and you still do, want $50 per crop per county. So let's so you, say you grow soybeans, you know, if you're in Lancaster County where I am, you, so, you grow soybeans, tobacco, and corn. Um, you'd pay 50 bucks for each of those. If you only grew in one county, that'd be $150. And, uh, and then there'd be an, an acreage, you know, multiplier, of course, uh, but uh, not on, you know, the, I, I shouldn't say that. There wouldn't be an acreage multiplier on that $50 charge. Um, that would just be a flat amount. And you were in the program. So uh, again, as I said, 1996, they repealed the mandatory requirement, uh, and that's when RMA was actually created, was in 1996. Um, uh, But that institutionalized this concept of the basic coverage 
uh, being so cheap that um, it was attractive enough and it was it it was viewed as uh, bringing people into the system in an introductory way that was a carrot, not a stick. Okay, so in the 90s and thereafter, the system grew to be what it is today. Uh, so again, not an old system, really, what we're living with today. Uh, RMA offered also, starting in the 90s, a lot of education and promotion of the benefits of crop insurance and risk management generally. Um, and so that began sort of that push to advertise and uh, uh, create education and put a lot of money into that because they it was recognized that that was really needed to sell this to people um, and to get to wean people off of this expectation that there'd be a legislative uh, ad hoc uh, disaster relief bill of some kind. Um, between 93 and 98, acreage that was insured through the federal program doubled to 180 million acres. Two thirds of the US planted acreage of all field crops became insured by 98. So it was pretty astronomical growth uh, very, very quickly. Uh, 2000 saw the expanded role where private insurers and others in the ag industry could present proposals to RMA for tweaks or different uh, changes to the existing products that might serve their industry or their little niche better. And so it became much more of a public-private partnership in the sense that um, not only were private insurance companies handling this for the government, but the private uh, ag industry was getting a seat at the table in devising new ways to ensure and new ways that policies, policies could work. And that continues up to today to the point where many of the new products that have come onto the market uh, have been the products of people like Farm Bureau and other um, uh, ag orgs who have put together the ideas for uh, products that then RMA has approved to be sold uh, as crop insurance. So by 2012, Hopefully, we're old enough to remember that. It just seems like yesterday to me. Um, uh, 1.17 million policies, 280 million acres insured under the federal program for $117 billion in crop value being insured through the federal program. So this now was a mature program. Uh, and we've pretty much been firing on the same cylinders ever since. Um, these are just some examples. By 2014, 87% of all corn was federally insured, 96% of all cotton, 88% of all soybeans, 84% of all wheat, uh, 130 different crops were eligible. They had gotten into expanding the program to include fruits. Of course, at the beginning, this was simply, um, you know, grains and field crops uh, that were much more predictable in, um, you know, pricing and uh, and the sort of the, the weather damage that would be incurred and, and what effect that would have. Fruits, that, be, that was a wild card, you know, when this all started. 32% uh, of vegetables, um, this is again a 2014 number, so vegetables were still lagging and, and still are really, but they're certainly come a long way since even 2014. Um, livestock and dairy, you know, at this point and since the, you know, 2014 have always been saying, what about us? Now, um, uh, those became more in the line, as I said at the very beginning, those, those coverages became more in the nature of price supports. In other words, uh, ensuring or creating a mechanism whereby a certain margin could be, per, or a guaranteed margin could, uh, could be, uh, uh, you could purchase a, a coverage from uh, USDA to guarantee you a certain margin on, you know, um, uh, uh, cattle or on dairy. Uh, and so those became revenue and price supports. Um, and, and again, we're going to set those aside for another day. Now, the Federal uh, uh, Crop Insurance Act, I have one section in here because I think it's uh, really interesting to just see how simple it's worded. But then there's a couple little things in here that are pretty interesting. Um, and, and it keeps and it sort of keeps you grounded if you look at it for a second. Okay, this is the ter the first two sections that basically kick off the whole thing. Um, okay, 
if sufficient actuarial data are, are available, uh, then the court that FCIC may insure provide reinsurance for insurers. Uh, so this whole idea of reinsuring the uh, private industry isn't necessarily the only concept that um, the statute envisions, but it is the way it goes now. Um, so the can provide insurance for producers of agricultural commodities grown in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now to qualify for coverage under a plan of insurance, the losses of the insured commodity must be due to drought, flood, or other natural disaster as determined by the secretary. So there is a bit of um, discretion with the secretary to uh, recognize certain things as, as I used the phrase before, an insurable event. And that's really an insurance term. Um, and so keep in mind this bolded language I have in here, keys all always back to there has to be an insurable event, some type of casualty loss, so to speak, um, some type of natural disaster that goes on. And that can get the lines between some of these programs can get blurred because um, USDA has grown some programs so far that they have become disconnected to a natural disaster or and they are simply uh, price supports. They are simply guaranteeing certain amounts of revenue. Um, and so some of the concepts have kind of get intermixed between um, uh, crop insurance and what would be uh, you know classic title one of the farm bill farm bill programs. Um, uh, and so, uh, or what used to be called direct payment programs. Okay, now, other interesting thing in there is just uh, uh, the language that talks about um, except in cases of tobacco, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and hemp, which they just added. That's, that's, so they get in here and amend this. I mean, they, that word was just added in 2014. 18. I believe that hemp wasn't added to this paragraph until 2018. I don't think it was added in 2014. Um, so except in those cases, insurance shall not extend beyond the period during which the insured commodity is in the field. That's really important because what that's saying is that when you put your commodity in storage, for example, or if it is in some way in the processing process or somewhere beyond the field, it is no longer insured under this under a RMA uh, administered policy. Um, now it does have a little bit of thing in here, a little co a coda or qualifier that says, as used in the preceding sentence, in the case of aquaculture species, the term field means the environment in which the commodity is produced. Okay, since it's water, not soil, um, but doesn't really back off the other thing. Now, Tobacco, I live around tobacco growers, so I know what that's all about. You know, you, you got the tobacco hanging in your barn for six months or longer. Um, so that remains insured while it's on your property, but in the barn, dry. Potatoes and sweet potatoes, I don't know enough about them to know what exactly it is that the potato lobby got in there. But, you know, the storage process, I presume, is what's being referred to there. And um, uh, so... They got themselves. They got themselves some special, uh, you know, dispensation that their potatoes continue to be covered even though they're out of the ground and are now elsewhere, presumably in storage. Hemp also, um, and you know, that's the whole concept of, uh, you know, the, the, there's so much processing that needs to be done in order to uh, make the commodity that you're producing when you grow hemp actually marketable that um, the, uh, you know, the, the actual raw commodity uh, is, continues to be covered by the crop insurance even when it's, after it's been pulled out of the ground, essentially. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the extent of that, I think, is gonna be something for the regs to fill in. And I bet they haven't even probably uh, promulgated those regs yet. There's probably some guidance or something uh, on, on that at this point, but because there are there is since 2018, limited availability for crop uh, insurance for hemp. Um, okay, now uh, this is the definition of agricultural commodity. I only put this in here to show you that in fact, here is the word hemp again. Uh, so they just tweaked this in 2018. It's interesting to look through this definition when you have a minute, and because there are things that probably fall outside of 
this is a this is sort of a cumbersome definition. Why you would go about defining agriculture commodity with these specific listings, uh, I don't know. Because we all kind of maybe have seen enough of the more generalized definition that's that's all encompassing uh, and doesn't have to be this long. Uh, and still be a, an effective and useful definition of ag commodity. But this does have some of those magic words that, you know, expand it, such as and other fruit and vegetables, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, it's an interesting exercise to sit here and figure out, well, what's actually not within this definition? And, you know, what are we going to see in the future, perhaps added to the definition uh, by necessity, like hemp was? Um, and then here's the regs there, there you see them at uh, in 7 CFR part 400. And that reg setup is a mess. I will just say that flat out. If you ever try to look at the uh, RMA regs and make sense of them, they are all over the place. They did they really did a poor job, and someday there has to be a recodification of all of those regs to put them in order. And believe me, from my years at PDA, I know very well, what disorganized regs are all about. Uh, anyone who's ever worked in the racing industry knows that well, but it's been fixed now. But, you know, regs where things appear all over the place are the worst. And these regs happen to be that way. Um, okay, now the structure of, uh, of crop insurance as we know it today. There's about 15 to 20 private insurance companies who are authorized to sell uh, by RMA, and they sell the products that RMA has approved for them to sell. RMA is deeply embedded in them in the sense that uh, RMA improves all the pro approves all the products, uh, you know, um, how they're offered, what the terms are, uh, where to offer, meaning what parts and what counties will be, you know, coverages will be available, available in some places, of course, that, you know, certain coverages won't be available because the risks are too high. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, all of that is, it's, you can use the word micromanage because that's really what it is. It's RMA micromanages the entire thing. And the private insurance companies simply take their marching orders from RMA. RMA does all the underwriting analysis. Um, and, uh, so what's the private insurance company's uh, incentive to sell, you might ask, which is a very logical question. And I think some drop out because they find it not to be something that they want to spend time on. Um, first of all, there is a percentage, and it's a pretty high percentage, of all of their administrative and operating costs related to the sale of these uh, federally backed insurance policies uh, that, that is reimbursed. Um, there is a standard reinsurance agreement, they call them SRAs, that are negotiated between the private insurance company and USDA. And that uh, reinsurance agreement is, uh, to me, fascinating. Again, I'm an insurance nerd, but um, uh, it really spells out you know, how, how this is going to work and what's in it for the private insurance company. Um, there is uh, there are also what's called livestock price reinsurance agreements for uh, a separate but program. Uh, but in any event, um, there's very limited livestock uh, uh, insurance, which I'll get to later. Uh, but the standard reinsurance agreement is is what controls everything. And I'll get to the the, the secret to those insurance agreements in a second. Okay, so here's some of the companies that that are that work with RMA right now to sell uh, policies. And there's like a find, uh, you know, find your or agent locator, I think they call it on the RMA website where you can look around. And this shows you who's got the market share. Um, Chubb operates under a, a, a another name when they sell crop insurance, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. So, so it is this QBE, but then you'll see some of these in the preceding slide, um, the logos from some of these companies. But in any event, you add all this stuff up in the market share over here. I'm not sure what you're going to get to. Uh, might have to add that up someday and see, you know, what's missing. But um, and this just shows you how much they write in premium dollars. So that just gives you an idea. Uh, not the insurance companies that we all, you know, know uh, that much. Although I will tell you, I used to work for Great American Insurance Company in the '90s, uh, as well as Zurich, and but uh, and I did crop insurance claims uh, for Great American uh, way back in the '90s. Uh, I have some uh, great war story if we ever have time. Okay, now, uh, so in addition to this cost allowance in their reinsurance agreement for all of this admin and operating expense, um, 
There are, in fact, are risk sharing terms between the FCIC and the company. So that's what's in it for them. You know, they're just more or less uh, getting their costs paid otherwise, but they do actually share in the risk in the sense that um, at the end of a uh, uh, an underwriting year, when they finally have completed the books on an underwriting year, they do share in either the profit or the loss that may have been realized. Now, the way the loss is dealt with is complicated. And we won't get into the details of that. But the bottom line is that's where something is in it for them because they are sharing in the net overall, hopefully, profit from the enterprise. Um, and, and that's really what's in it for them. Um, you know, obviously the private insurer has all contact with the policyholder. They collect all the premiums. They send the premiums to RMA. Uh, they administer the claims and they pay the indemnity and then RMA reimburses them uh, for all of that. So what's really in it for them is this uh, little risk sharing terms that are in these uh, reinsurance agreements. Um, and here's just this, uh, this is a, a, a slide that tells you about their, um, their cut or their uh, ability to share in the gain or the loss that occurs once, you know, a, a reinsurance year has been completed. Okay, code word risk. Okay, now, so now we have the model that we live with today. Policies are based upon a normal crop yield based on actual production history and a commodity price based on estimated market conditions. So the farmer selects a percentage of their normal yield to be insured. Remember, I was telling you about the 50%, um, you know, uh, you would insure losses over 50% in that cat catastrophic coverage. So that was a 50%, you know, uh, uh, essentially um, percentage picked for the first choice, so to speak. And then the farmer picks a percentage of the price they want to receive. Um, and I forget in the catastrophic whether it was like 65 or what, I forget what the, what the amount was, but essentially these are the two components of just about every crop insurance offering from RMA, which is the farmer picks a percentage of their yield that is essentially going to be insured. There's always going to be some amount that is deductible, but the highest you can ever buy is 75%, which means that you have a 25% of that loss that you just have to eat. Um, and then uh, you insure a percentage of the uh, gross price that you would have uh, received for the um, uh, for your commodity had you produced uh, your your imputed yield or your your normal yield. Okay, um, and there's also, of course. Um, uh, coverage for prevented planting, which is a little different equation um, uh, because you just couldn't get the things in the ground. So you're going to have a different way of figuring out what your loss is. Sometimes it's just delayed planting. Sometimes it's completely prevented planting. So the premium increases, obviously, as the percentage of, of the price that you're getting uh, increases. Uh, now, here's the, here's the statistic. Your average premium subsidy from the federal government in the federal crop insurance program is 62%. Um, and I think that's pretty much a steady in, you know, uh, increase over the years. Um, again, as we said before, the basic catastrophic coverage is 100% subsidized. Now, there's two types of crop insurance in the federal system. There's yield-based and revenue-based. Yield-based is the old-fashioned one. That's the one that we just talked about now, which is you have an indemnity paid if the, if it, the yield loss uh, occurs relative to your historical normal loss, um, and uh, you know that's measured by uh, just the amount of the commodity that you have produced. Okay, uh, and then you know the the uh, uh, there is a anticipated market price that is used to uh, multiply. Now, revenue-based is a much newer product that was developed later, and that begins to uh, get into mixing these concepts of revenue insurance, because what you're doing here is you still have to have a casualty loss and everything, but what you're, what you're uh, doing is you're uh, protecting against the revenue loss um, in yield or price or both. So, um, 
based upon the commodity price that's estimated annually, and it's not it's not based upon a model of what it should be, uh, as some of the uh, price support systems are. Um, so you have, I have another slide on the uh, on the differences between these, which we'll get to in a, in a second. Okay, so on a standard old fashioned yield based uh, policy, um, the uh, normal yield is assigned based on the actual production history, again, of the actual farm, of this actual farmer. Um, and it's usually based over some span like four to 10 years. And then uh, there's a commodity price that's based upon an estimated market condition, a theoretical market condition. And then you select your, your uh, how much uh, of, your of your loss on your yield you want insured. And then you select how much of your, uh, of your revenue or your income, if not for the loss, uh, you want to have insured. And uh, then that essentially figures, you know, computes your payment. Um, the, let's go through here and see if we can uh, uh, speed up a little bit. So um, with the, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, so with the catastrophic coverage, I explained, you know, before you get, um, Okay, actually, the catastrophic coverage has now now been raised to three hundred dollars per crop per county from the original of fifty dollars per crop per county. Um, so you uh, in the catastrophic coverage again, you re receive uh, payment once you've gotten over the fifty percent threshold. So you've you essentially eat the first fifty percent of your yield loss, and then you get. It's 55, not 65. So you get 65% of the anticipated revenue that you would have gotten. Um, so you essentially are eating 45% of your price loss. Um, so catastrophic coverage, again, doesn't make you whole, but it is dirt cheap, so to speak. Um, let's go to revenue. Okay. So revenue-based coverage was first uh, uh, um, uh, offered in 1997. Um, and by 2003, it had completely surpassed yield-based coverages. Uh, and um, uh, so now, um, the interesting thing about uh, uh, revenue-based coverage is that um, you are choosing a target level of revenue, regardless of whether the shortfall in your revenue is caused by just low prices or low or your low production. So, in other words, um, you're you're getting to hedge um, market conditions in the midst of hedging against your production losses. So it begins to mix up the concept of uh, ensuring revenue with the concept of ensuring a production amount. Uh, and so that's, you know, that, and that's essentially where almost all the programs are going now. Um, all right, and, Brooke, I'm going to remind you about five minutes left. We want to leave okay. time for questions. We do have one question here and we'll get to that. And uh, please, anyone else who has a question, please put that in the chat. Now, the other piece that uh, has come along just recently is the concept of whole farm revenue protection. And this is essentially a policy that aggregates revenue across a farm's full scope uh, of what they do, multiple crops, and it might include crops and livestock together. Um, and essentially, you are <clears throat> uh, accommodating a modern you know, setup where you have a very diverse um, set of commodities being produced and a very diverse combination of revenue on a farm. In other words, moving away from you know, sort of a monoculture model where you are insuring one crop um, and maybe you only have income from one or two crops. And so you're insuring one crop at a time. You're buying a policy on corn. You're buying a policy on soybeans. The whole farm revenue is essentially insuring you against a targeted revenue number that you would uh, uh, anticipate making on from everything that you're doing put together. So essentially, all the other principles still apply, uh, but it's just a different benchmark that you're going against. All right, uh, we'll skip this for a second, second except to say, uh, remember this term moral hazard, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second. Um, 
Okay, so there's still problems with the system. I mean, there's a lot of things that are still unsatisfactory. For one, the higher price that you get for organic uh, uh, commodities and other kind of direct sale and niche markets like selling to restaurants and other food purveyors that pay higher prices than you know a wholesaler does, uh, that's not really served well by the current products that they that are being sold. Um, it also there's no insurance for specialty crop producers against. Um, new things that they're going to encounter with FSMA uh, that when they have unmarketable product for, due to some food safety problem or contamination problem. Um, animal producers still aren't getting uh, anything uh, acceptable and, and, and workable for catastrophic disease events. What happens when an integrator in a you know, poultry operation goes bankrupt and the contract growers, you know, they don't have a way to insure against that kind of a thing. Biomass producers for renewable energy don't have a, uh, a product that works for them because they're, what they're, the market they're selling into is completely outside of what crop insurance works with. Um, and you know, hemp growers are still stuck with no thing, nothing to deal with when they get a hot plant, in other words, something that is over the allowable THC, uh, or if they get pollination problems, uh, particularly uh, you know, if they get a, a crop that gets destroyed because males got, you know, male plants got close enough that the, the uh, uh, a proper growth cycle of the plant was disturbed. Um, so these are some of the, there are lots of little tiny uh, programs and variations on those basic themes of the yield and the revenue um, uh, based uh, products, but they all incorporate that basic uh, those two basic concepts, either it's yield based or it's revenue based. Um, and, uh, and, and all these products, these are, this is a list of what they have on the RMA website, but all of these products deal in those same things. Okay, so that's crop insurance. Now, there are a couple of other things that deal with uh, paying for disasters. This is a program, the non-insured crop disaster program is for when you have a pro, you have a crop that was not insurable under standard crop insurance. And it works very similar. Uh, I'm gonna just move through that. Now, livestock mortality insurance, because people may be saying to themselves, well, what about you know, high path avian influenza? Well, um, that at this point in time, animal mortality uh, coverage has not caught up to uh, the modern world at this point. And we still have no federally subsidized livestock mortality insurance program. There are, so USDA pays for uh, healthy, poultry that had to be depopulated due to or in order to stop the spread of the disease. They do not pay for poultry that was diagnosed and killed by the disease. So there still is nothing for that. There used to be, and there still is, animal mortality coverage for like expensive breeding stock or racehorses. That's a real specialized product. And, you know, this concept of moral hazard came into play because that's the concept of, well, isn't this there's an incentive to, you know, essentially let your own animals die to collect the insurance proceeds? That's what moral hazard means. Uh, All right, Brooke, I'm always, gonna pause you. All right, I'm sorry, uh, hold on, hold on. So that was always, moral hazard always was um, a backdrop to all of this is this suspicion that people are gonna somehow um, you know, tank their own crop to collect the insurance money. So with that, we will go ahead. These are other livestock indemnity programs that I just want to mention because I said there were none. There are tiny ones. And then here is a whole bunch of resources. All right. What do we got for questions? All right. So we've got uh, one on, on cover crops. And it says, so cover so crop insurance on cover crops used to protect soil health. If you do a second round of cover crops in some regions, would those second that second round, would that be covered under your insurance policy or would that be determined by the insurer? Can you talk on that a little bit, please? I don't know the clear answer to that, although I know that that was a huge issue um, in, you know, just in the last couple of years was, you know, a second planting. And I'm sure we could look up the answer to that question because a second planting, you know, uh, of cover crops was definitely, um, you know, a, an issue when COVID hit. 
Uh, and it was there was a lot of dialogue over that. I don't know the exact answer to that question, however. Okay. Okay. And then another one on all of this specific to mushroom farming, where could you direct someone who's interested in crop insurance specifically for mushroom farming? I do believe that um, RMA, uh, they have a commodity like search function where you just put in commodities and they will, it, it pops up and tells you all the products that they sell for that commodity. So that's definitely available. You, the, the RMA website is well done. Apart from the regs being a mess, their website's great. Um, so I think you could find that fairly easily. Do you want to email me? Uh, well, I'll dig it up for you. We can do that. And then we included that RMA website on our resources list. So you could start there and then um, and use that search function like Brooke just said. All right. I think that's all for questions. So Brooke, if you have you have about three minutes if you want to do a quick wrap. Okay. All right. Um, let me go back for a sec. By the way, here, let me let me I'll stop here for one second. These uh Congressional Research Service uh uh CRS. Uh, booklets. Um, these are all excellent, excellent. Uh, and there is a brand new one here, you know, Farm Bill Primer, you know, for the coming discussion of the Farm Bill that just came out in August um, that encompasses the entire federal crop insurance program. And then there's one from May earlier in this year that is all about fruits and vegetables and especially crops, which is kind of like the that's the power, that's that's the frontier territory right now is trying to get that industry uh, fully insured the way field crops and grains and everything have been for years um, to make sure that that's uh, available for them. And there's even one on him. Um, okay, let me go back a little bit. I just want to say, just go over. Okay, there are there are a couple of small livestock uh, mortality or livestock indemnity programs. Um, one of them is called Livestock Indemnity Program, oddly enough, uh, and they all have these acronyms. Uh, but uh, this one is mostly for ranchers out west, um, or that's who uses it, I think, um, as you can probably see by just the description here. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the, the, the program was just amended in 2018 that says, okay, the Livestock Indemnity Program now covers diseases that are caused or transmitted by a vector, that means, you know, uh, a living organism transfers a disease. Gee, this sounds a lot like HPAI. It sounds like high path avian influenza and are not controlled by vaccination. Sounds like a high path avian influenza or an accept or not controlled by an acceptable management practice, which is high path uh, avian influenza again. But this does not cover HPAI. So we have a program that, you know, uses all the magic words, uh, but does not cover uh, high path avian in influenza. And that is really, um, that is going to be, because if we are now in this world where uh, uh, HPAI is with us every year in some degree, and we're gonna have to live the life that we've been living this year every, every single season, every single summer, uh, then there is no question that a uh, an animal indemnity program of some type is going to have to be started because right now, you know, USDA, while they have a lot of money sitting around because of the appropriations that were uh, in the last three appropriations bills, you know, um, the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act and then the Consolidated Budget of 2021, there's so much money flying around that that APHIS has enough money to pay animal indemnity, um, but they don't. There's still uh, a lot of uninsured, or uncovered, unindemnified losses going on with HPAI. And if we're going to live with this every year, then that is going to be the area. So I would expect that um, in the new farm bill negotiations, there is going to be something that is going to address a uh, an insurance program, whether they call it that or not, something permanent for high path avian influenza, uh, because this is now turning into a, uh, you know, a, uh, an ad hoc disaster uh, uh, relief program that doesn't look like it may have an end. 
um, you know, unless the pathologist can figure out an end to it. So, okay, I'll stop there. All right, well, thank you all so much. Uh, Brooke, I would ask you to advance to the very last slide there um, mm -hmm. of, our, of our PowerPoint. Um, that that does it for us. Thank you so much for attending. Um, there is a question in the chat about the November 18th webinar. The events page for that will be up today. So just check back some point today and we'll have that. You can register for that. Um, again, we have several upcoming webinars in our Understanding Agricultural Law series. So thank you all for attending and have a wonderful weekend.